Ralph, uh, we have a, a lovely group here that are so excited to meet you, but I wanted to do a, just a little introduction and just talk about you. You're a, uh, you know, you are really one of the landmark directors in animation. And you had the most successful independent animated film ever made uh, with Fritz the Cat making something like $90 million for a $700,000 budget. But uh, what I was wondering is if maybe we could start the, the conversation off with a question from me. Quentin Tarantino is an admirer of yours. How did yeah. you meet or how did he get to know you? And what's the connection between you and Quentin Tarantino? Absolutely nothing. Quentin Tarantino went crazy over cool over Coonskin. He thought Coonskin was one of the greatest movies ever made. Uh, what I was saying, how outrageous it was. But, you know, he's screening my Coonskin all over the country. And, taking, and his secretary wrote me a letter saying, you better stop him. He thinks he's you, which is very funny. I, so I don't have any idea. I never spoke to him. I know he loves the picture. He wrote the foreword to your book, though, unfiltered. I don't. The writers of the book got to him, but they knew he loved my picture. I mean, Coonskin. I was very happy you wrote the book. You know, it's nice. It's nice to have the name on the cover. So, but I never met the guy. I never spoke to him. These things happen in Hollywood between publicity directors, hustlers, and different people who know how to play the game. Yeah, I get I, I, They know how to play the game is the word, but you're incredible at playing the game. How you sold the films you sold is a bit, is actually a recurring question. So do you want to talk about why you made the movie Coonskin? Like, you know, how did all that even start? First of all, my, my background in growing up um, was very different than most people. My parents were immigrants escaping from the Nazis. In Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, there were, nobody wanted to serve the black people there. So here I am in 1946 or 44 or 45, living in a totally black neighborhood in our nation's capital, believe it or not, which is segregated. All my friends were black. Everybody was black. The movies I went to were black. The kids were so funny. And there was no problem at all. Um, they used to walk around in the summertime, listen to this, great sense of humor. They used to tie great June bugs with cotton to their feet and fly them over their heads. Let the June... So we used to walk down the street with these bugs flying over our heads. And I walked with my sister 50 blocks to go to school in a white neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I asked my mother, how can we be in the nation's capital? and have segregation. My mother didn't know how to answer me. I also saw that during the Vietnam days when I was a young man, right, starting to make my films, where black soldiers, who were my friends from Washington and in Brooklyn, were coming home from the war. They still could not eat in the luncheonette where the white people ate, and they still had to sit in the back of the bus. These are black soldiers. So what, I, what did I learn? I learned a lot. I personally loved Uncle Remus tales when I was a kid. I used to read them all the time. And then I found out it was, it was possibly a black slave who wrote it to say things against the white people that he wasn't allowed to say. That's also where the tale of the Tar Baby comes from, where uh, the Tar Baby won't answer Br'er Rabbit. And uh, as a result, he gets all tangled up in the tar. And you use that same concept in uh, Coonskin. And it got quite surreal. Absolutely. Uh, say I was reading about Uncle Remus in uh, Wikipedia, and your name is mentioned. Really? In the notes, it says, Ralph Bakshi's film Coonskin in 1975 is a satire of the Disney film, which adapts and mocks Uncle Remus uh, stories in a contemporary Harlem setting. You, you, what do you think? That doesn't make any sense because you're not doing a satire of the Disney film. That's what I it know. says. I know. And right. you would adapt and mock Uncle Remus, which I don't think you do. I think what you do is you give a new context to those characters 
and uh, and Brer Rabbit is kind of more like Dirty Harry. He's coming to a place to clean it up. Well, it's more like Malcolm X. Brer Rabbit to me was a was Malcolm X. The picture was originally named Harlem Nights, which both meant heroes and knights. And I love night. Most of my films are nights. But every studio in those days, don't forget, it's 35, 40, 45 years ago. All the studios in those days, because the segregation was so rampant, had and no, no black films were made except for a couple of exploitation films, had a black overseer to make sure that we white people were correct in how we treated them and how we hired them. And I agreed with that. That, well, that was much needed. I mean, that, that's nothing I oppose. So, Yeah, uh, uh, well, uh, that's why I'm interested in the inspiration for the film. You lived among black people, and yes. you, you apparently at some point you felt you needed to tell the story of what was happening to the black community. Absolutely. Yeah, so oh, that was your motivation. You wanted to tell people the truth about what was really going on. Well, you see, Barry, this is what's so important about Coonskin and traffic. And, you know, Fritz was telling about the phoniness of the revolution. Sure. What I'm saying is what I was doing was using animation to attack the stupidity of humanity. Sure. And under the cover of the... Have, this is a sexy film. This is a dirty film. That was my cover. That was what was bringing the people in. And that's what the movie companies thought they were buying. But what I was really doing, and that was meditated on my part, was discussing the ills of mankind, the satire. I understood uh, the black pain because I walked 30 blocks to go to school. The content of my films, Michael's father, the racism, all the things that, that why I meant the films, such as social satire and commentary on how we live, they just took it as uh, outrageous. In fact, all the people that made films that thought they were doing adult films just had sex as this thing. And my thing was about the social condition under which we live. Very important to me. And the other stuff, the sex and the outrageousness, was a cover for me to be able to to say to everyone that this America is destroying the black population and that the mafia is selling drugs in Harlem. And this is what I was able to do. Now, you understand even Al Ruddy. So Al Ruddy comes up and says, you know, it's too tame. Harlem Nights, um, it's too tame. So how about calling a coonskin? I said, what are you? I don't want that. Uh, he yeah. says, well, I'm the producer. Uh, and I found out again that he was the producer. <laughs> so I had nothing to do with it. I said, well, how about Kuzka no more? As not that I really wanted it, but I was trying to soften it. He says, oh, Kuzka, forget it. So now it's Kuzka. I go back to work. As the film progressed, I learned more and more about what I was saying. And because I love montage, it allowed me to cut in poems that I wrote that were never in the original screenplay. So I kept building this film and cutting in emotional things that would let the audience know <clears throat> that even though some of the blacks in my film were as dumb as some of the whites, this is where I was going. Basically, my film was very pro-black, but I was doing it in a way that satire does it. And I was doing it in a way where I never, for a second, separated that they weren't individual Americans. And that's always been my thing. There was so much misinformation around. It's, it's, it's extraordinary. No one knows what Kuzkin was about. You're getting a better idea now. Oh, yeah. No, and I so, can see. So it's viewers. all rooted in Black heritage. The artist I used. Listen to this. Okay, so in Kuzkin, I used for the poem... Um, this is how I was thinking. For the poem, uh, the cockroach poem, I used the style of the animation at George Herriman, who did Crazy Cat, and is black. I remember Roma Bearden is a great collage artist. I got his drawings on the wall. I, I cut stuff out of art books and put Bearden on the walls of various things. So I was using also black artists I was the things a total homage to the black community in so many ways. But even I'm forgetting. All right, 
Now the picture is finished finally. And on the day it was finished, so we we're going to screen it in the museum of Barana who saw the film and thought it was the greatest thing in the world. You know, uh, they wanted to screen their film and I said, absolutely. So that's, we're going to New York the next day. I just got the work for it. Then. No one saw the film except them. A couple of newspapers saw it. And what I heard on the grapevine was they thought it was stunning. Mm. Stunningly perfect. Okay. So the guy comes in the office, has a meeting with Al. Very nice guy. Black guy. The guy whose job was to oversee it. said, look, Al. He says, I don't like the title. It's wrong. I breathe a sigh of relief. I said, thank God. Well, Al didn't see it that way. Al got very incensed. Of course, he was the producer of The Godfather, mind you, the year before he had won an Academy Award. So here was somebody telling the producer of The Godfather that he doesn't like the title. And of course, it was his title. That's why he got so upset. In other words, it was my title, which I wish it was. He would have probably given it in, change the title. Say, Ralph, change it. Change your stupid title, Ralph. But because it was his title, through the guy, he told the guy to leave that he was going to don't tell him what to do because I'm a producer and blah blah blah. And the guy left. When the guy left, he took a look at Al and said, "I'm going. I can. I know the look for Brooklyn. I know the look. The look says I'm going to get you, man. I'm really going to get you ready." So the next day at the Museum of Modern Art, the next night when we flew in, Al Sharpton was there, and I always felt he was called by this black guy, this black overseer, he had to write and said, hey. And they will go to the stage, a confrontation on the film, and I said to them from the podium, and so as the film opened, the, the screening of the film, the whole back of the audience, which was filled the museum of modern art with people, were these 40 black guys with Al Sharpton in the back, and they all got clubs, they're trying to scare us. I'm, I'm not scared, I thought they're fooling around. So I'm screaming at Sharp, and you haven't seen the film. What are you doing? Because I don't have to see the film or the title like that. I know what it is. I know shit when I smell it. He says, yeah. He says, you know, that's what he said. Oh, they were being tough. I got it, you know. Um, so that's the controversy started then. In other words, now when the film ended, Sharpton was walking down the aisles to confront me because I was on stage screaming at him. And he says, we're going to beat you guys up. We're going to blah, blah, blah. And he and the 40 guys behind him, who's supposed to be following him down, he turns around and says, hey, you guys, come on. They loved the film. They didn't follow him. I mean, that's how crazy it is. At any rate, that's how the controversy started. Then it, from there, it just took off. In other words, it's out of control. Core, which was out shop, they blocked the elevators of Paramount. They don't let the executives out. And the executives said, Kuzka, what is Kuzka? Who is Bakshi? <laughs> they don't want to bother with the film. And that kind of problem for an animated film. I mean, if it was a live action film with a major actor in it, they might have, but this is an animated film. They're not going to get that. You think it's racist, it's racist, we'll throw it out. I mean, that's what animation was. See, today animation is a very big deal. When I was doing it, it was on its deathbed. But I used that to know that nobody was looking. But you have to understand, I did a picture of the, with the producer of The Godfather, and I called The Godfather in the in Coonskin, the movie. I made him a monster, and I made all his sons gay, not so much of. And this is already, no problem with that. I don't think, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is what I'm facing with America. Um, so from that on, it just took off, and people who never saw it thought it was racist, and people heard it was racist, and of course he's, he's shooting riots, he's shooting taxi driver, and he's shooting riots on Broadway. Was there out at night picking up footage? <laughs> and he shows me a reel and a smoke bomb. It's just insane. Um, everyone, and the controversy became the thing, and I'm there, I'm defending the controversy. When I, all I'm saying is, look at the film. It's pro-black. It still plays today because of mankind. is just as stupid. Nothing has changed. Everyone is just separating everyone from themselves. You're white, or you're black, or you're Muslim. You're, we're all the same. You can't tell. If you just put clips on the air, 
you know, it could go either way, but you don't know what you're looking at. In context, this America, the mafia, and the racism, the the racist cop, et cetera, et cetera, and all the things point to a very pro-black image, which is what Uncle Remus was, Br'er Rabbit was, uh, which I am. Now, as far as my naivete, I was very disjointed. I felt hurt. Uh, I was kept defending the film. Tell me, tell me something, though. Why did the Museum of Modern Art choose to screen Coonskin? They loved it. Yeah. Vince Campy called it one of the great 10 pictures of all times. The NACP, the Black Organization, sent me a letter saying it wasn't racist, it was on the money. In other words, the fact that it was called racist was what happened because of Sharpton. Sure. I got more great reviews. First of all, I think Kuzkin is my best picture. The inserts of poems, the collaging, the live action and animation. I mean, they said it. And so did Vince Campy. And so did the, the guys in Chicago. And so did Charles Chaplin. Did There's, you write the cockroach poem? Of course I did. There isn't anything in Coonskin that I did not write or create. Uh, after watching it, I can see it a lot more clearly. I can see, too, uh, that if you hadn't had that title... The title was indefensible. <laughs> All night! Beautiful, the three guys going to Harlem to fight the mafia. It was a perfect... And it was a cartoon. Yeah. I was on animation. The greatest animators in the world worked on that picture. It's still playing. It's still made... It would have been a massive hit. Yeah. It would have been a massive hit. You know what it cost? About a million one bucks. <laughs> Anyhow, okay. I'm gone, guys. All Thanks. Right. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Thank you. 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 Th